we have a quorum. So let's call this meeting to order. This meeting will be held wholly remotely. And members, during the meeting, please use the virtual background function of Zoom and show the appropriate color. And members participating in this meeting must be within the territory of Hong Kong. And if you want to speak, please use the raise hand button in Zoom. And our staff will show a timer on the Zoom screen. When you're approaching the end of your speaking time limit and when time is up, the counter will go off. And let me remind members that during the meeting, you must keep the video cameras on to show your faces, whereas the microphones will only be switched on upon my instruction. Item one on the agenda, meeting with the administration. Let me remind members in relation to the declaration of interest requirement under rule 83A of the rules of procedure. If there is any direct or indirect pecuniary interest in relation to the item being discussed at the Bills Committee, the member should disclose the nature of his interest before he speaks. The Bills Committee has already issued invitations for receiving written submissions from the public. And once the written submissions have been received, they will be circulated to members and forwarded to the administration for consideration and for response. Mr. Tony Chair has also written to the chair of the Booth Committee to express his views. His letter has already been forwarded to the administration for their consideration. May I welcome the administration to our meeting. At the last meeting, we completed scrutiny of class six of the bill. We now start and resume our class by class scrutiny of the bill, starting with class seven. That's the Chinese version of LC paper CB record 3151-2022. Mr. Lam, you may continue. We finished discussing classes five and six in relation to the arrangements for tenants and landlords. Uh, clause seven offers a similar arrangement. That is in a case where the landlord has a secured loan. And meanwhile, if the landlord is unable to pay, and if the tenant fails to pay the rent and the landlord is barred from taking action uh, in relation to the tenant's repayment default, clause seven provides this scenario. So clause seven, 1A, if the, tenant, if the tenant fails to pay the rent in compliance with the tenancy, the, but the landlord's right to take action is barred. And if the period falls between the 1st of January, 2022 and the end of the protection period, and if section five bracket six applies in relation to the affected period, then if the landlord is able to establish the reason that I just referred to as the significant or sole reason of not being able to repay, then having considered the nature and magnitude of the tenant's failure and the repayment default, the overall financial condition of the landlord, this clause should apply. And then similar to the previous clause for landlords and tenants, if the action hasn't been taken, then the action cannot be taken forward uh, as per clause seven bracket five. As for pending actions, the actions are as set out in clause seven bracket five. For bracket six, a lender is not barred 
And I'm sorry, let me repeat. A lender is not barred from taking action on a ground other than the repayment default. And then clause seven, sub clause seven, If the lender commits an offense, then on conviction on indictment, he will be fined twice the amount of the repayment default or in any case, not less than $50,000 unless the court considers that imposing lower fine is just and equitable. And then sub clause eight, there is definition of landlord and landlord includes a guarantor or a surety or any other related person. Ms. Kong, you have a question. Thank you, Chairman. I have a question for the administration. For commercial properties, one mortgage may cover a number of properties, and there may be more than one uh, borrower, more than one property involved. So for one mortgage covering multiple properties, if there is repayment default for one of the properties, according to clause seven, the bank will need to enforce the mortgage agreement. And if it covers three properties, then will the bank be able to take action against the two other properties? Which class, uh, which subclass in class seven covers uh, the scenario I mentioned? Mr. Lamb. I'll invite Mr. Chan from HKMA to take your question. Thank you, Ms. Kong. Thank you, Mr. Lam. Class seven bracket one provides that if a security is created on any premises, then it applies. So if one of the properties are leased as a scheduled premises under this package mortgage, then clause seven bracket one does apply. Ms. Kong refers to a loan agreement covering more than one borrower. And in fact, if you turn to subclause eight, the definition of landlord includes guarantor, surety, and any or person uh, mentioned in paragraph A relating to his business. In other words, uh, the bank can go after these individuals. In the case of the guarantor or surety of the landlord, if clause seven does apply, then even if there is repayment default, the bank cannot take action against the guarantor or surety of the landlord in relation to subclass two. Um, did I answer Ms. Kong's question? Okay, yes, thank you, Chairman. As long as there is this uh, undertaking. In fact, so we already covered subclass, I mean, clause uh, eight, Mr. Lamb, similar to clause six. This relates to the relationship between landlords and tenants or lender borrower. And despite any action taken by the uh, borrower, no conduct by or on behalf of the lender or secure loan is to be regarded as waiving a right of the lender under the security arrangement or agreement. And then sub clause two, upon expiry of the affected period, the lender is not far from taking or exercising his right to take action. And then sub clause three, If the lender can only exercise certain right within the a specified period, that period is to be extended after expiry to the, of the affected period. 
that is of the same length as the uh, effective period. And then sub clause four relates to the definition of effective period. Any other questions? Please continue. Clause nine, the financial secretary is empowered to amend the schedule by way of publishing a notice in the Gazette. And the schedule covers different types of premises and their interpretation under the bill. All right, no question. You, we can move on to the schedule. Part one, interpretation. Uh, they covered a childcare center, um, employment agency, travel agent, tutorial, school, schedule premises, cruise ship catering business premises, and then part two, specified premises. Um, and that includes schedule premises and items two to 17, the different types of specified premises. Reference has been drawn to the industries that uh, the AEF 6.0 support. Mr. Lam, I have a question. Part two and part one refers to schedule premises, catering business pre premises, and also for the CAP 599F you just referred to, as far as the catering industry is concerned, I think you're only focusing on uh, dining in service and because of the uh, evening dining ban, these restaurants were the hardest hit. In fact, in starting from mid-March, many of these restaurants have suspended their operations. However, I want to clarify because there are premises only offering takeout, serve, uh, takeout food, even for a bakery, for example, the fact is they are in a predicament because of the work from home arrangement. And uh, at least 40 to 50 percent of the employees in the in the industry are either close contacts or confirmed they are unable to go to work. I know bakeries and coffee shops want of employees. So for the specified premises, I don't think this is clearly spelled out here, apart from the CAP 599F premises that you referred to. You mentioned the premises receiving subsidies under the sixth round of the anti-epidemic fund. I agree. Well, even for supermarkets, they also have a food license or rest, um, uh, food licenses or, or refreshment licenses, but they are excluded from the list. Some premises in the catering industry have 11 types of licenses, some 29,000 of them, and they're in a predicament. What about premises often only take away food, but not dining service? Can they be included? They may have business, but they, but in fact, in the past two months, civil servants, employees in the private sector have all been subject to work from home arrangements and they don't have any business. So Mr. Chuck, can you give it a thought and perhaps move an amendment? And Chairman. Well, in this uh, schedule is following to the uh, 599F uh, catering premises as pitched in that ordinance. Therefore, the sale and the provision of food and drinks within the premises for consumption and drinking. Therefore, you're right. Currently, the scope only covers a catering business premises that provide a dine-in 
if you're just a takeaway outlet, then you're excluded. Well, uh, well uh, for the scenario described by the chairman, we need to proactively consider to include the takeaway outlets. Well, for, we had once considered whether uh, bakeries can be covered at the retail uh, outlets. Since the chairman brought it up, we might need to refine the interpretation for catering business premises. Uh, we might move CSA as a later stage. Well, frankly speaking, for the 29,000 licensed uh, catering premises, well, those provide dine-in are doing miserable. They only have 10 to 20% of their business. And even for the bakeries, they told us they lost 30 to 40% of their business in February and March, especially for March, they simply do not have any, enough staff to stay open. So thank you for your consideration. Mr. Lamp, please carry on. Uh, pardon, Ms. Yin is young. And Chairman, I wanna talk about uh, the catering business. But these uh, central kitchens are also affected since the restaurant cannot open. Well, for a, a column 2.13 premises where the business are providing catering business for schools and post-secondary institutions. Well, you said you would consider uh, moving CSAs. We consider uh, those along the uh, value chain, for example, the central kitchens, as they do not have any business from the restaurants. Will you consider that as well? Ms. Young, uh, let me uh, chip in. For the 29,000 licensees, cover more than that, included at the university canteens. However, they may not have a license. Well, speaking of central kitchens, if they uh, provide lunch boxes to secondary and primary schools, since the schools are not open and yet they need to support their, uh, or still pay their staff, I hope this church can consider that the canteens operating in the universities, since we are having Zoom classes, however, they do not have the food license or they may not have any licenses. Uh, they are operating under the university. And also from Ms. Young, a lot of people are chasing me for the clubhouses. A lot of Clauses is during the previous closure that in Bentley 599 have somehow some of the licenses or club houses were in very good business. For example, the jockey club, it used to be very quiet and now they are full and you couldn't walk in. So Ms. for Ms. Young's question, I would like to broaden it and query Mr. Chuck. Thank you, Chairman. Let me step it back for the clubhouses. It is covered under 599F as a specified premises. Therefore, no special treatment is needed. Well, according to Chairman and the Ms. Young for the central kitchens, this gives rise to another problem, not just the central kitchens, maybe some of the uh, food factories uh, as well. We need to consider that. Since that you bring it up, uh, we will consider on how to include them. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Lamb, please continue. Well, that's pretty much the end of this bill. And a well will members comments on the type of premises covered. So no uh, question from members. May I ask the legal advisor for the English version of the bill, do you have any comments on the provisions and the drafting? Uh, no comments on this.
So for no further questions, we have now complete the class by class examination. Since we have completed the class by class examination and the amendments proposed by Mr. Lewis Lung and Ms. Doreen Kong, this refer to CB bracket 1142-202203 and CB bracket 1152-2022 bracket 01. May I invite Mr. Lung and Ms. Kong to walk us through their proposed amendments. And then I shall invite the administration to respond. Is Mr. Lung with us? For the two uh, amendments, First, uh, uh, restrict the scope to the small and medium enterprises with reference to the eligibility to the criteria under the SME financing guarantee scheme. And two, the protection period uh, by uh, framing it within the three months and about removing the mention of January 1st, 2022. So that uh, uh, we can provide a three months protection period for the uh, eligible SMEs. Ms. Kong. Thank you, Chairman. Well, my, the, our proposed three amendments. First, the definition on the tenancy after the last meeting and the official explanation. I won't insist on the first amendment on uh, amending the definition of tenancy. For the other two, I wish to supplement. Even though in principle, I support a uh, support for a uh, smaller tenants. However, uh, it would not to total at the expense of the landlord. Well, the uh, commercial tenancies, the rent usually excluded outgoings like uh, air conditioning rates and management fees. So the tenants should be responsible for the uh, AC, and manager suite and so on. And the chairman expressed understanding at this point. However, in this bill, there's no definition on the uh, rent. And for the uh, class five bracket four and class five bracket six, if the tenants are required to pay rates, government rent and management fees and other go goings, the tenants may, should pay, such fees before enjoying protection. But most of the tenants, in case they are in default, would usually uh, own the management fees and rates and so on. My amendment is based on fairness. While helping the tenants, we also uh, reduce the loss of the landlords uh, on the uh, borrowing the banks from uh, chasing default payments of the landlords. The bill stated that the landlord needs to prove the landlord's over financial health and the severity of the default. If the guarantors do not need, the, if the uh, tenants don't need to prove their financial difficulty, why do we need to require proof of the landlords? Therefore, for clause seven one B and seven bracket two, we should repeal the bank. The clause banks need to consider the two factors so that uh, they could enjoy the protection of a state in, in proceedings. If the protection period is three months, the, my proposed amendments should be reasonable. Within the protection period, the tenants should pay the, all the outgoings and expenses where the banks will need to asking the landlords to showing financial proof. All this back and forth will also take two to three months. 
if we include these two factors of the condition, it's really intimidating to landlords without any major effect. Compared to other jurisdictions, our bill is quite tilted towards the tenants and there are no support infrastructure to help the tenants and the landlords to resolve any uh, disputes. If both sides decide to take the dispute to court, it will take years. That would be quite annoying to the land both sides. The government claims that the tens of thousands of commercial properties are being covered. Besides uh, understanding of the tenant's dilemma, they will also try to reduce the losses of especially smaller tenants in order to put everyone on the same boat. Over the past weekend, for the, on my proposed amendments, I've uh, consulted various trade associations and commercial property investors. In just two days, I received a lot of signatures supporting my amendment. And I will provide them to the financial secretary's office later. I know the government claimed to have strong urgency for the early passage to pass this bill with deep ramifications. Therefore, I know the possibility of my amendments being accepted at extremely low. However, I still want to propose it anyway. At least I want to uh, try to seek justice for the tens of thousands of smaller landlords. I hope that members can support my amendments. I think that um, while well, helping those in need and fairness are not mutually exclusive, I hope that also the, uh, guidance will be provided on my amendments. Mr. Lam and Mr. Chuck, do you like to respond to the two members? Allow me to respond first to Mr. Long's amendments. Uh, the whether we need to limit the scope to the SMEs or to all the companies. At the last Friday meeting, Mr. Chuck has spent considerable time explaining uh, the legislative intent is to uh, protect all the uh, tenants. Well, I know the SME are the hardest hit. However, I hope that all the tenants can be uh, protected. If we accept Mr. Long's uh, amendments, even though uh, some of the land tenants are being hard to sit, do not be uh, eligible for protection. And last time, as I said, that some of the catering premises are from this are operated by the smaller listed companies. If we deliberately exclude the listed companies. There shall be deep ramifications I and mean, led to the closure of the relevant um, premises and led to a search and employment. And we disagree that the listed companies will abuse this protection as there will be a price to be paid. If they decide to default in rent, they will also lead to interest charge. If they're capable of repayment, I'm sure they would not abuse this mechanism. So that's about the scope of the protection. For the commencement date, well, the, uh, this wave actually started in January this year. If we, uh, as well on, if we, if the protection period let's say for the original post of 1st of January, but only within the three months with a protection period, this will uh, undermine the efficacy of this bill. Because industries were hit the hardest a few months after the 1st of January, 2022. If we exclude this period, we may not be able to offer the maximum protection for tenants. On these reasons, the government does not support Mr. Long's amendments. As for the amendments proposed by Ms. Kong, they cover two major aspects. First, the rates, government rent, management, management fees and other outgoings should be paid by a tenant for the protection to be applicable. And also the second reason, landlords should put forward certain factors to establish 
that um, the tenant's failure to pay rent is the sole reason for his inability to avoid the repayment default in order to enjoy the protection. Now, the first point, usually a tenancy agreement stipulates the liability, the payment liabilities. If they form part of the rent payable under the tenancy by the tenant, then landlords will not be responsible for the relevant rates, rents or fees. We don't see a strong reason why we should spell it out expressly in the ordinance. And according to the government's proposal, be it landlord or the tenant, depending on which party uh, is responsible for the payment of rates, rents and management fees, etc. I mean, especially for government rent, uh, payment of rates and rents of affected properties can be deferred free of surcharge of, or interest. On the point of the landlord being the subject of action, um, to be taken by the lender in the case of repayment default, it's relatively easy to show proof to the lender that situations such as the rental receipts uh, and the condition in general. When applying for a mortgage, these documents are usually required and will be submitted to banks. Uh, they are relatively easy to produce. We don't find it a uh, very harsh and unreasonable requirement. We don't impose a similar requirement on tenants because they may need to do a lot to prove um, the income and expenditure records. And if we pose too many obstacles during the three month period for a tenant affected to enjoy the protection, it may go against um, the original intent, and we may be putting too much uh, burden on the affected tenants. Uh, perhaps I'll stop here, Mr. Long, Ms. Kong. Any further response from the administration after um, hearing their replies? Let me see. Legal advisor, I see your hand is in the air. I'd like to supplement about Mr. Long's proposed amendment. He raised a point about retroactivity of this piece of legislation. In different uh, pieces of legislation in Hong Kong, there is retroactivity. And previous uh, judgments show that retroactivity is possible. It depends on the units or the parties affected by the piece of legislation and whether they're given equal and fair treatment. This is the consideration for introducing a retroactive element. Mr. Longhan Bill. Thank you, Chairman, for giving me the chance to respond. I just heard the reply from the administration. I understand that there is little chance my um, amendment will be accepted. Still, I want to raise this issue. Like the legal advisor just now said, it's a matter of reasonableness. And I understand fully that there is, it's not that there is no retroactivity in the common law system. I'm just saying that the circumstances are very unique and we do need to help these affected tenants. Meanwhile, we must also bear in mind that some of the landlords operate on a small to medium scale. I hope you can strike 
an appropriate balance. You cannot assume that uh, landlord's financial status must be better off than the tenant. I just want to make this point. Ms. Kong, I see you. your hand is in the air. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I understand the administration's explanation, um, albeit uh, that I cannot agree. After three months, uh, you, I, I see the impact on uh, landlords, and by then we will find out whether my assertion is true. So for the two members uh, who have proposed amendments, may I know whether you will move an amendment on your own, or would you, subject to members' agreement, like the Bills Committee to propose this amendment on your behalf, Mr. Long? Chairman, I do hope that uh, my amendment can be moved in the name of the Bills Committee, if I have uh, members' support, of course. Uh, Ms. Kong, I reckon your stance is the same. Yes, I appeal to members to support my amendment. Right, if that is the case, uh, we need to vote on this matter. Members? I mean, only members who are present at the time of voting can vote on it. Any voting to be conducted at this meeting must be done by using the raise hand function via Zoom. And members, during the process, you must show your faces and you must also raise your hand to facilitate um, the clerk's counting. And gallery view will be adopted so that all members' faces can be shown. Let me remind members that only members of the Bills Committee are eligible to vote. All understood? Right. Would the staff please now switch the screen to gallery view and members please turn on the uh, video cameras of Zoom and show your faces. May I ask the clerk whether we have a quorum? Right, we have a quorum. Those in favor of the proposal that the Bills Committee should move the CSAs, should I call it CSAs, on the members' behalf. Right, those in favor of having the Bills Committee move Mr. Long Hampil's amendment or CSAs on his behalf, um, please raise your hand. As the Secretariat noted um, all the markers, Right, those against, please raise your hand. Those against. Right, has the Secretariat uh, recorded the result? Please put down your hand. Those abstaining, please raise your hand. All right, this is in relation to the CSAs proposed by Mr. Lung Hon Biu. May I know the result, please? Horace. OK, 
Okay. The results are out. We have two in support and 10 against. So Mr. Long, please move the CSAs on your own. We now move on to vote on Ms. Doreen Kong's CSAs. Members, those in favor, please raise your hands. Okay, hands down, please. Those against, please raise your hands. Okay, hands down. Those abstaining, please raise your hands. Okay, thank you, hands down. Mr. Clark, do we have the voting result? Uh, the connection is not steady. I think that we have more against than those in favor. So um, the motion is not carried. Uh, the connection is not stable. Uh, is there a CSA? Mr. Chuck? Is the administration going to move CSAs? Um, sorry, I didn't catch it. Let me repeat, I don't know why either. Is the administration going to move amendments? Yes, it will be done in due course. Any other comments from members? If there are no further comments, the Bills Committee has completed the scrutiny of the bill. So, Mr. Chirk, do you have a timetable for resuming the second reading of the bill? Chairman, as explained in the last meeting, this Friday, we will give notice and we propose to resume the second reading of the bill and the third reading on the 27th of April. Uh, the connection is not steady. Let me remind members. The Bills Committee will submit the report to the House Committee on the 8th of April. And if you want to move a CSA, the deadline for giving notice is the 14th of April. I thank the administration, uh, including the uh, Bureau representatives, uh, DOJ, and uh, our Secretariat for your assistance. And I thank members for going through the bill here. And then second item on the agenda, any other business, nothing under AOB. So uh, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you.